work session items include tonight. We're going to have a presentation by Kate Auto on the charging, on auto EV charging options. We also have a presentation on the gateway project. Is there any public that would like to comment on this work with the items? Seeing none, we'll move right on. Presentation by Hamo Auto EV Charging Options. Kevin. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for thank you for making the time. My name is Kevin Cardell. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Hodge Automotive. Uh, we play in the EV charging space. My company is partnered with NLX, um, which is a manufacturer of EV charging equipment, and that is one of the uh, arms of NL, which is based in Italy and the 80th largest uh, company in the world. So they're backing my company to build out a Michigan and a national EV charging network. So for Michigan, we partnered with Consumers Energy, uh, DTE in the Metro Detroit area, and the Michigan Eagle Fund uh, to build out a, uh, a Michigan network that's targeting downtown municipalities and what we call destination charging options. Uh, so the purpose of tonight's presentation is to discuss EV charging options for Manistee. So Michigan State conducted a study a couple of years back on prime cities or target cities to build out an EV charging network. And Manistee is one of those main, uh, main spots along, the, uh, along that map. So after careful review, um, we have reached out to, to Beth and have asked for a few minutes to discuss EV charging options for, for Manistee. So my company, uh, with our network, we're calling it the Red E Charging Network. Uh, what we've pitched to about 50 municipalities throughout the state of Michigan is a no-cost EV charging option for downtown parking. So my company will pay for all of the hardware, all of the installation, all of the maintenance, and anything that goes wrong with the, uh, with the chargers uh, over the life of the agreements. And in exchange for two to four parking spaces, uh, we'll provide a monthly revenue share back to the city and back to the, uh, the site host uh, for allowing us to use the parking spots. Um, typical contract lengths are anywhere between five and ten years based on the technology used um, and uh, the revenue share that's provided back. Uh, but the charges themselves are, um, I would say, future-proof. They are designed to be faster than what the current cars on the market can accept today. Um, the current vehicles can only accept up to 11.5 kilowatts per hour. Uh, these chargers will go up to 19.2, um, and that's future-proofing because these vehicles uh, will be able to accept that higher rate of speed in 2024 and 2025, so it's more of a future-proof technology. Uh, so typically these chargers have been ranked globally um, best in class or near best in class, so that J.D. Power and a handful of other reviewers had listed them either number one or number two from a quality and longevity perspective. Um, and that's, the, uh, that's an overview of, of the, the technology and, and uh, my company. So allowing EV chargers in your downtown municipality, it uh, allows each of the cities to get on the map. So when EV drivers are going between um, different municipalities or using <laughs> as a destination charge, uh, those locations will be on the, uh, on the maps for them to find. Obviously, as everything's moving towards green, it's a, a helpful, uh, helpful tool to add to the, to the city. Any questions? I can go into additional detail on the different types of technology, or more into my company as all well, as a whole, or NLS. Uh, depends on, on where we'd like to take the conversation. Any questions? Where would we uh, be looking to put these two parking places? So typically what we do for most municipalities is we target, I would say, destination charging parking lots, public parking close to downtown restaurants and shops or theaters. And so for people that come into town or are passing through town that will stop, have dinner, uh, do some shopping, spend one to two hours in that location, that's where we would want to keep the charger. So I notice as I drove around downtown, there's about two or three different parking lots that would be an ideal location to put 
put two uh, two to four chargers in, in there. We put to put them more than more in more than one spot. Yep, so for some municipalities, we're putting them in two different parking lots, and some we're putting them in three, others in one. So for Boeing, we have them in two different places around the downtown. In East Grand Rapids, we're actually going to one on one side of the downtown, one on the other side of the downtown. Um, in Kalkaska, it's in one primary parking lot. Depends on, on the needs of the city and, and how far the downtown stretches and where the shops and restaurants are located. We want to make it as easy and accessible as, as possible to, to drivers. I have a question. Sure. It's a naive question because I think the answer is no. Um, would this would these chargers be compatible with um, golf carts? Because we recently passed an ordinance so that you could drive golf carts in the city. I would I would believe no. They are compatible with motorcycles and, uh, and vehicles. If they do a a, a one seven seven two charger in port, then it would. Otherwise, if it's just a plug in, then. I'd have to see the golf carts themselves to, to know. It could be any model, as okay. long as they're registered. With sure, sure. How many charging stations are you looking at for a municipality the size of the city? For here, just to start, I would say two, just to just to get going. Right now, it's a bit of a we're early for a couple of years. Early, uh, a lot of the automakers are launching you know, most of their EV vehicles in the next three or four years. By 2025. Volkswagen and a handful of other OEMs will only be making electric vehicles, no more internal combustion engines. So it is it is relatively early. Uh, that's why the Michigan Eagle Fund and consumers and DT have launched these rebates in advance to get the infrastructure up and running until you know before the cars make it to the uh, make it to the road. So in terms of usage, it might be a little late for the next 12 to 18 months, and then as more cars launch, then it will see start to grow. And also, how long is the average charge? How long does it take to get a full charge? So it depends on, depends on the technology and depends on the car. Uh, my partner has a uh, BMW i3, and it's a 33 kilowatt battery. It'll take him from 0 to 100 about two hours. Um, with the chargers that we're looking to put in, it's, it's, it's a lot shorter. For a Tesla that's a 100 kilowatt battery, that could take take anywhere for five hours. The, the goal is not to charge a vehicle from zero to 100. It's, it's more of providing an amenity. Um, and uh, you know, for every hour that it's charged, it provides 60 to 80 miles of additional range. So if somebody comes in and they have dinner, and then they do some shopping, and they're there for an hour and a half or two hours, you've provided over 100 miles of additional range for them to continue on their way. Right? A lot of the charging primarily is going to be you know, at home. But if you have people on the road and, and traveling, then then you're going to need that, that time. I, I, I drove my wife's uh, Honda CRV here because there aren't enough chargers for me to get, get here and get home. So it's just an additional money that will, that will help that. I have a question. Um, not knowing anything about these kinds of cars, what kind of energy source would you need to install these? Is it would you partner with Consumer Energy or? Yep, so Consumers is uh, the one driving us on, on, on this part of the, of the state. So they are actually taking care of all of the all of the power, all of the new meter. Um, if we were to move forward with this, I would have my own my own new meter, uh, my own address for those for those spots, just from the billing purpose, because my company would pay for all the electricity and all the all the rest of that. And so consumers, they take about one to two months for a make ready process. So when we come to an agreement on the terms and and, and such, then they do their due diligence. They'll send their engineers out to make sure that there's power available there, that there's a new meter, that there's a new address. Come in and install the equipment. And it would actually run off of off of that meter in our our address. So how long would the project take to like from the beginning to the end? To get it for a level for a level two like this, this would take probably four to six weeks for the consumers to do their make ready and for us to be able to install. For the faster DC fast charging um, options, and those can charge a car in 15, <coughs> 15 minutes to thirty minutes. That's a three month process, uh, and they have to bring in a new transformer and all the rest of that. What we're, what we're proposing from a level two perspective is a, is a short four to, four to six weeks in total from, from an engineering and installation perspective. Okay. These are all smart home compatible? All of them are, yep. So you'd be able to pay for it just as you would for paying for parking in the downtown street. Um, there's a QR code on the front of the charger. You could scan that with your phone and that would bring up the, uh, the payment options. Um, and the company, my company, would. 
we've, we've aligned on a model of um, you know, 30, 34 cents per kilowatt hour um, for a level two charger is, is, what we're, is what we're going with. And, uh, and that, uh, that, comes, that is paid for directly from the credit card from the consumer. Do other municipalities generally sign a lease agreement with you on parking spaces that it, it's so they all sign an agreement. I, I don't want to call it a. I don't want to call it a lease. It's it's. Those, we ask that those spots are you know reserved for EV charging only, but it's it's not a. In some cases, it's not a requirement. So it's basically a, a, a right of access type of agreement that we're allowed to use. Those two spots, we have access to those two spots. They'll be you know clear of snow and debris, and then we'll, we'll have our chargers and we'll maintain our chargers. I see we have a person that would be able to mention. Do you have a question? Yeah, am I allowed for a question? Sure. Just state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Beata. I am a resident of Pilot Township, but we're very interested in the um, development in NSD. Mm -hmm. Kevin, can you show how NSD and the charging stations that you're planning fit into the broader map of Michigan? Like, if you charge for two hours, where would it get you next? What, what are your next plans? Is there a there is. Uh, I don't have that accessible right now. I can I can share that with you, with you later. So there is there, there is a Michigan map for my company. We have a, a, a ready map that is that shows all the all the cities and all the pinpoints and, and where you can get uh, get along. Um, there's also a, a, a broader. If you look at an app called PlugShare, now a lot of the, the chargers that you'll find on that are, are private, um, so you kind of have to filter out those. But you'll be able to see how to get from. Detroit to Manistee to Traverse City to Mackinac, etc. Uh, so our my company is building out that uh, building out that route. So with Manistee, and you tie it to the Traverse City chargers that we're putting in, and the Mackinac chargers, and, and, and the rest of those, you'll be able to go from here to Sault Ste. Marie, um, on, on just on level two, so if you stopped and had lunch and then dinner, etc. Are these charging stations compatible? with all current electric vehicles. Yes, yes. So the, the issue that, uh, not the issue, what we've, what we've found is we started to, uh, to launch or, or, or build out our network is um, there's a bit of a confusion on, on which chargers work with which vehicles. Uh, and just for, um, I guess, clarity's sake, the Tesla fast chargers can only work with Teslas. So the charger talks to the car, and if the car is not a Tesla, the charger doesn't turn on. So that's only, a, it's only for Tesla only. Our chargers are compatible with, or Analexis chargers, I should say, are compatible with every vehicle, including Tesla. So Teslas just have an adapter that they have to put on the end of theirs, on, on the end of the, um, let's say, the plug, and they're able to use our chargers as well. So it's 100% compatible across the board, all vehicles. Any other questions, Council? Sure. Yeah, I was going to ask Seven to come to the DOT and talk Thank you, Kevin. We appreciate your time. Thank you. <coughs> Next is presentation of the Gateway Project, Seattle Development, and Little River Holdings. You're up. Okay. Get the presentation pulled up here. Perfect. I'll give you a second to move if you want to move. Okay. Fine. There's a few slides in here. Associate for CL Real Estate, and our partners here in Manistee are the Little River Holding, 
I just wanted to introduce them as well. Uh, Eugene is here, uh, the CEO of Little River Holdings, he's in the back, as well as Tom St. Dennis and uh, Tyler Lebanon, and then uh, my boss for scale real estate, uh, Nathan Watson, is also here. Uh, and I'll bring up Nathan and Tom later for some questions if there aren't at the end. Um, so, and again, I just want to say uh, this, this project that you're going to see here today, this is to be the beginning of it. Um, we've put a lot of work into it so far, and we're excited to show you what we've done. So, uh, just a little bit about the partners here, the Little River Band of Auto Indians, you guys should be familiar with. They've been a long-standing presence here in, in Manistee, this has been their ancestral homeland. And so, they've been guided by a series of principles in all projects that they want to do. And those, you can see those written out over there. And with their principles and mission, uh, we feel this project fits quite well uh, with what they want to see as something that respects their homeland as well as respects the community and helps bring everything up uh, to a new level of uh, prosperity and economic development for the city. So in the past, uh, and it's still going on actually with the Little River Holding, they're working on this uh, large housing development in uh, Fruitport, Michigan, uh, Odin Oak, as well as, uh, as you guys should be familiar with, with the casino and the casino being the largest employer up here in Manistee County. And so they have a large impact uh, within the local region, the community, and the area. So then a little bit about CL uh, Real Estate. Uh, we were founded a few years back by a couple there in the middle, Peter Mango, with a similar mission to helping their community in their backyard by uh, investing in projects and uh, different opportunities that will help lift up the community on a different economic level. And so you can just see a series of different projects and buildings that we've got in the works that we're working on or will be soon in the near future. We were created in Illinois and we have expanded here into Michigan and our motto is big ideas, small towns and you should see that, that interwoven uh, with our mission for helping the community uh, as again as we partner with Little River Holdings for what we're going to present here as the Gateway Project. Uh, these are just a couple of slides that show some of the stuff that CL you know, Real Estate has done in the past. Uh, this is our commercial craft brewery that we have in Ottawa, Illinois. So you can see that the level of quality we put into uh, making something that's out of about 20,000 people uh, that has economically impacted the community in such a positive way. Um, on the next slide you'll see this is the Kiefer Hotel that we're working on here in Hillsdale, Michigan, um, down in the southern part of the state, and it's a boutique hotel and historic property, uh, as well as a theater renovation. And so we have uh, begun with the Kiefer to enter way into Michigan, and so Manistee will be our next project here in the state. And so to focus more on what we're doing here, you can see this is the River Street. So where we have uh, B, C, D, and E, that is the south side of River Street. Uh, and A is the north side along 31 on the corner properties. And so this is, you say, a gateway project. It truly is a gateway project. It encompasses both sides uh, of the street along the river and along 31, which will help create a summit and entryway, welcoming uh, more and more visitors into downtown Manistee then let them continue to pass on on 31. And so this is a, uh, one of our first renderings. This shows you kind of a high level site plan of what we're proposing to do there. So you can see on the north side of River Street, that's where we're putting the boutique hotel. Uh, on the south side to form the other part of the gateway, at the beginning is the Welcome Center. Uh, and then going down the street toward the west, where the Cadillac Heating and Plumbing is, and that's a proposed event center. Uh, and then the last spot is a business incubator called the uh, Manistee Marketplace. So this is just another uh, angle to show you a little bit more of the site plan from an elevated view. Uh, again, featuring the hotel, the welcome center, the event space. It's a light touch to the area on some of the back property, as well as a uh, prominent tour 31, uh, again, to, to form such a uh, beautiful gateway to welcome more people into the city. Uh, so this shows you from a street level the proposed hotel, and I want to stress these are early concept rendering, so things will change as we progress with the project, but this is where we are today. Uh, we're excited for what we've gotten so far, um, and you can see the hotel on the right, and then you can see the Welcome Center on the left, and there's a Welcome Center and office space, uh, which we're still working on putting together. And this is just kind of some inspirational images provided to us for what the uh, Welcome Center uh, will look like. Uh, again, none of this, this is just uh, images that were provided to us by the CBB here in Manistee to show you what uh, what could be possible, something that's prominent that welcomes people into the community and you can see from all different angles as you go through and it helps introduce the region. The event space here, uh, this just shows you it's a large Go Trust building on the inside. It's beautiful opportunities for uh, event spaces to bring more and more entertainment and activities downtown, which will help make downtown Manistee a year-round uh, area even more so. Uh, and it 
being featured right in the middle will allow more and more traffic to come through, uh, pedestrian traffic and, and so on to all the different businesses around town. Uh, and then lastly, the Nasty Marketplace. And so the Nasty Marketplace is what we're uh, naming the business incubator right now. And this is an opportunity to create a series of small booths that allow uh, new entrepreneurs an opportunity to uh, get a, a low barrier to entry for creating a new business to try something out for a, a summer, a summer into winter, so they can understand you know, creating a business plan, a marketing plan, uh, finances, and, and help them encourage uh, new business owners to create something and hopefully move into a retail space in the downtown block and start to fill in any sort of gaps that are created and continue to drive in new businesses that uh, more and more people want to see as they come year to year as they change. So we're really excited about that component. We'll be working with uh, different entities around the city to help put that together uh, to keep it running and, and keep it managed well. Uh, and so, you know, the economic impact from this project, with five parcels being a part of this, all very different parcels, but working together uh, for one one big mission of again lifting up um, the economy to a new to a new height here with increased businesses, significant job creation, uh, directly and indirectly, where uh, with more visitors coming in off the, the road into the downtown, they can um, stay longer by having a property, a hotel stuff uh, placed here on the corner within the downtown, and so more travelers can stay longer, wander around through the community, and so that will create more indirect job growth in all the additional businesses. It helps increase business uh, vitality uh, and viability throughout the town and encourages more businesses to see that there's uh, something, there's more growth coming down the road. Uh, and then additionally, the, the benefits here to the community besides the economic side of it, um, you know, with the job, we hope through the hotel to employ a significant amount of jobs that are accessible to the community, uh, to the region, as well as providing continuing education programs and on-the-job training, as well as internships and apprenticeships that really help uh, uh, move people into uh, well-paying jobs and hopefully up the, up the ladder into something even better. Um, and additionally, I kind of talked about the, hotel, the downtown impact, but it will also impact the region as well um, by keeping more visitors here to Manistee to, to really growing the destination that this beautiful community already is. Uh, more will see that and will stay here longer and begin to explore the miles of trails and beaches and golf courses that this community has to offer. Uh, so we're, we're excited with all of that as different components to, uh, to fit into this project besides just building uh, a series of different parcels. Our timeline in general, uh, for, between now and the rest of the year, we're hoping to get our applications and documents ready to go for the city uh, for different requests, uh, for an approval for permitting and so on. And then hopefully in 2021, we can push forward finalizing all of the different components of the project from the capital stack onward to be able to get to construction. Now, obviously we're, we're all wearing masks, so you know, we know COVID is still an active presence here and it has certainly shaken the the market for uh, development, but we hope that we can stick to a timeline similar to this. And uh, so far, nothing has dissuaded us or uh, changed where we're headed. And we hope we can continue to work as we have been over the past few years to get this project uh, to fruition uh, here for the community. So with that, uh, this is a, just a beautiful picture of historic uh, Manistee. As you can see, this is taken in the middle of that gateway on River Street at one block, um, looking to the beautiful downtown. So if there are any questions, I'd like to just hand it over to Nathan Watson, he's the general manager of Steel Real Estate. Um, and um, uh, on the south side of the street, 
Uh, there uh, is, we'll be opening up parking that's pretty much been closed off around the Cadillac building and behind the um, uh, two buildings there at the corner, including the dry cleaners. So we'll be providing additional parking in the area. I like the sounds of that, thank you. Any other questions? Do you need anything from us, Mr. Taylor? No, this is just an opportunity for CL and Little River Holdings to introduce the concept to, to the council and obviously to the community. Uh, it's very early stages. They're still working on uh, all the details, that, but they just wanted to give you a peek behind the curtain on what they're, what they're doing and just answer any questions you might have. So I would encourage you, if you have any questions, please take the opportunity. Well, I know that uh, it's an ambitious project, and I know that the city is trying to get more housing in because we're short on housing for short term, long term. Uh, do you anticipate very many people coming in when you start this project? Um, I'm, uh, you mean, are we adding uh, more housing or more people who need to be housed? Any housing with, with Oh, no, we're not doing housing in this particular area. We think this site is most best situated. I mean, really, it's, it's kind of a combination of things. Like, what is the market? What will the market bear? And what does the gateway need? And we certainly believe in downtown living, and we have that in other of our projects. We like that idea a lot, and would like to see more of it. Um, it could happen on this site down the road. That's why we're kind of taking a lighter approach to some of these development sites. For example, we're preserving the um, the, the gas station that's there at the corner of River and that division. Um, and uh, that could become a, a more intense development later on. But this is a good interim use that really activates things. Um, it helps uh, draw more people into downtown Nasty. Um, and uh, the hotel obviously is meeting a need that's really uh, uh, been uh, clearly identified in the Nasty market uh, for additional uh, hotel rooms. Um, and um, also on the south side, that corner is really, you know, ideally situated for a welcome center and some office. Um, and uh, the rest of the site, we're kind of, you know, we're leaving the Cadillac plumbing building, hopefully putting a facade on it. it looks very much like the original one. Um, so bringing some of that historic element back in there. We'll be preserving that one historic building um, facade and incorporating that into that welcome center building. So kind of creating, uh, maintaining some of the character. But the corner building itself, the, the, um, the idea for this incubator and this, uh, uh, you know, a place for small business uh, people to uh, try out a new business for some uh, uh, mentoring um, is, to, uh, is a light touch so that you can do something more intense down the road. But we'd like to see more of that. And, you know, we're here for the long haul. Uh, we know our partner, Little, Little River Holdings, is also an effective partnering with someone in some downtown, downtown housing now, um, elsewhere in the downtown. Um, you know, we see that could be a good possibility for us to consider in the future. Do you have any idea how many jobs this might create? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, I think that we're looking at about 135, 145 permanent jobs for all of the different uses. The bulk of those would be in the hotel, probably about half would be in the hotel. Um, and then, of course, construction, based on our budgeting, probably, you know, 200, 50, 300 people. Um, you know, it depends on the ultimate cost that we have to look at. Uh, oh, it's right there. <laughs> yeah, right. 145 uh, direct jobs created and 300 construction jobs. Of course, those are temporary jobs. Yeah. And there will be some indirect job creation, too, from the increased expenditure. Anything else, Council? So you're going to start breaking, you're going to break ground Monday? <laughs> I'm going to ask Brad. <laughs> uh, we'd love to, but um, you know, obviously the development is too complicated, and so we're, we're working diligently on it. That's what I can say. We're working diligently on it with our partners in this, um, moving forward as quickly as we can, um, you know, uh, dealing with the realities of uh, development in this phase of our uh, nation's economy and region economy. But we're really confident that we'll be able to pull this off and um, developments in downtowns, you know, we worked all exclusively in small Midwestern towns. And so developments take time and patience, perseverance. I think any development takes time and patience and perseverance, but perhaps more so in a small town, because you're trying to realize a market that hasn't been realized for a while. And there isn't a, you know, a, like 30 other businesses just like this one that you can um, go to the bank and say, hey, look, there's 30 existing businesses that are doing just exactly what we're proposing here. You know, find 
finance this one. It's a little more challenging, but it's doable. And um, uh, we, we call it uh, part of the, you know, we, we have three criteria for projects, uh, our principles do. It has to be uh, economically sustainable. It has to be uh, transformative, pay back to the community, create jobs, create a transformative catalytic project that spurs other people to do things. Um, and the third one is it has to be fun. And we certainly believe that raising capital for projects like this is fun. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you for being involved in, in the city of Manistee and pushing this project forward. Uh, I'm sure council appreciates the effort. We're looking forward to working with you. Uh, Little River Holdings, thank you so much. I know you played an important part in starting this. Um, we're really looking forward to good things happening. Thank you so much for your time. We do appreciate it. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to be here. We love Manistee. Uh, we're uh, grateful that the community invited us here for a developer's day um, through economic development efforts and what the city had going on. Those were very important to uh, bring us here. And uh, we're glad to be here and I hope to be here for a long, long time. I remember when this was just talked about a little bit. And to see it go from that point to where we're at today is very exciting. Uh, very encouraging. Yes. Thanks again. Okay, we're down, we're down to others. Mr. Taylor, do you have anything else? No, I don't. Council members, do you have anything? Yeah. Um, Dad, I went and talked to the gentleman up at 3rd and Maple reference to housing for the businesses downtown. And why the state got involved in getting permits. What are we doing with that? I know you talked to Vanderwall. And the well, we, Safe Build has been talking with the um, Bureau, of, I think it's a Bureau of Construction both at the state level, trying to get this ironed out. We're not getting the success that we would like, and so we've asked uh, Senator Vanderwall and his office to intervene, and they're working on our behalf to try to get a resolution on this. Well, they keep telling me that it's all illegal, that we can fish with other permits for some businesses downtown. And they and, uh, shouldn't be having that big of a problem if they go to their bosses or something. That why are they involved in this thing? We give the permits over to the cities, give them permits. That's what we don't understand that either, and that's what we're trying to figure out because uh, we, we took back our authority to issue permits January 1st, and we've uh, found occasions where they've issued permits, some they've pulled back, some they haven't. So we got to get this resolved. And, and in talking with Safe Built, uh, this is not an isolated incident that's happening in other areas across the state. So that's why we asked the senator in, to intervene on behalf of not only us, but the entire state. So we're working on it. I don't know when or if it'll get resolved, but we're doing what we can. Do we need to write a letter to the city? To... No, I, I don't think we're there yet. Um, uh, state Built's been very good in communicating with the powers to be at the state level. And I've been in contact with the senator and his office and providing information. And I think we're covered right there. But I appreciate the offer. Anybody else? Jeff, there was just one more thing. Jeff, I was reading in some of the notes of the staff meeting, and they talked about the uh, tennis court up at 8th and Robinson Street. Are we just going to let that go? down the road or what are we going to do? I know it's in there, just said about digging it up or something. Yeah, that park is actually owned, uh, co-owned by the city of Manistee and the Manistee Area Public Schools. So at a recent uh, meeting of that control board, uh, we decided that, first of all, the tennis courts in their current condition cannot be rehabbed. They have to be removed and replaced. And uh, so we were going to take the first step in removing those so that the unsafe condition doesn't, doesn't put anybody at risk. Well, the thing is, you know, remember we argued here a while back because the school was going to get involved, we got some grants for that, and they put it down at First Street Beach. And I think I asked at that time, what is going to happen to tennis courts at 8? And we thought that maybe we'd be doing something with them. Because if the school builds their own, they're going to be out of first year. The first uh, grant application that we made to the community foundation was to rehab the tennis courts at, at Sands Park that you're referring to. The community foundation also received applications from uh, other entities for the pickleball courts, such as in Manistee Township. 
So uh, the Community Foundation convened a whole bunch of community partners, including coaches, the local tennis groups, um, the two communities, and they actually went out and evaluated on their own, or as a group, the facilities that are available, and uh, recommended that the tennis courts of Mansfield Township would be uh, advisable to be upgraded for pickleball, pickleball play, and that uh, the tennis courts at First Street were a much less expensive rehab than a full reconstruction of the ones at Sands Park. So uh, we didn't, we were not successful in our grant application the first round, but we were successful this round. And I think our estimate was 165,000. It's been a while to rehab those, to rebuild those four courts at Sands Park. Um, the city doesn't have money allocated towards that, and the school would need to participate at 50 percent of the capital cost for that too, and they don't have the resources at this time. Anything else? Seeing none, we're adjourned.